This is a place like no other in the world. These canyons and washes hold out a secret, a secret involving early man and a unique beast. For decades, scientists have been coming to California's Channel Islands in pursuit of a creature that existed only here. Where did it come from? How did it evolve and survive? And what killed it off? Today on California's Channel Islands, scientists are applying the latest techniques of modern archaeology to work on this vast historical puzzle. These islands are the key to understanding a creature that appeared suddenly and then vanished. The question is, why? Sooner or later, everyone who studies pygmy mammoths comes to the Channel Islands. The Channel Islands are absolutely unique from a mammoth hunter's viewpoint. They're the only place in the world that we've got pygmy mammoths, meaning a mammoth that's roughly half the size of the mainland mammoth. Santa Rosa Island is one of the many sites that paleontologist Larry Agenbrod has worked in an almost 40-year career of hunting mammoths. He started out studying early man, but switched to mammoths when he once saw the bones of a mammoth cast aside because they weren't considered an important part of the human past. We found one mammoth too old to have human association, so they left the animal in the field. And I kind of felt like that was wrong, and ultimately I made a conscious decision to forget the people who hunted them and study the mammoth go from the hunter to the hunted, go from the predator to the prey. And it's been an exciting journey for me. There. We can both dig at the same time. That'll work. Great. Thank you. Larry has come to Santa Rosa with archaeologist Don Morris. Morris knows the place well and has spent much of his career studying the island's first human inhabitants. I don't know how many times I've walked here on the northwest side of Santa Rosa Island, probably close to 50. There's hardly been a time when I haven't seen something there. Pygmy hunting starts with a ground survey. That's got a pretty wild, wide circle of air in here, about 100 feet. GPS monitors pinpoint so the location of the so bones and show just how the remains have moved in time and space. What we've got is a vertebra it was just barely exposed in the cliff face up there. You can see where it's white. That's what was exposed. This is a pygmy mammoth. Pretty good specimen. So far, Larry and Don have located over 140 sites that hold mammoth bones, mostly pygmies. The pygmy mammoth is an island form of the Colombian mammoth, which is the most common mainland mammoth for temperate North America. The pygmy was, in essence, a Colombian mammoth, shrunk by more than 50%. They weighed two tons and were under six feet. The head had a slightly higher crown than a Colombian. Tusks averaged two to three feet. The trunk was perfect for eating and for touching others of its kind. Its short legs and muscles were made for these islands. Thousands of years of island evolution went into this creature. Pygmy remains are only found on the Channel Islands of San Miguel, Santa Rosa, and Santa Cruz. For Agenbrod, it's a mystery wrapped around a number of questions. How did they get here? How did they become small? Why did they become small? What kind of, uh, of environment shaped the specimen that we have in these pygmy mammoths? These mammoth laden islands are part of the Channel Islands National Park, a sanctuary for marine life. In contrast to the commerce that steams down the Santa Barbara Channel, 
These waters are full of sea life. From the black volcanic rock of Anacapa to the sand formations of San Miguel, each island is different. Isolation spanning great stretches of time has created enclaves that harbor a vast array of plant and wildlife. Santa Rosa is the second largest island. Its 82 square miles are largely folded mountains, chiseled canyons, and rolling marine terraces. For creatures that are no longer with us, it's a vast boneyard. For thousands of years, the grasses of Santa Rosa provided for the island creatures. And for most of this century, that grass made ranching possible. Today, the cattle are gone, and the island is reverting to its natural state. For those who worked the island, Santa Rosa was more than ranching. It was an education, a life lesson in evolution. It was a paleontologist's dream with bones constantly erupting from the earth by the action of wind and rain. Ranchers and cowhands often collected such bones. Their discoveries taught us that a world of ancient beasts existed long before man settled here. Though mammoth bones often show up suddenly and insistently, few finds were as stunning as the one made by geologist Tom Rockwell. We found the spinal column and the back of the skull of a pygmy mammoth exposed, eroding out of the edge of a Pleistocene dune. The entire column from the back of the head all the way down to the pelvis was exposed. And it had lichen growing on and it was clearly old. I didn't realize at the time or appreciate that it was unique and I went down and looked at it, and I was accustomed to seeing isolated bones. I'd never seen any bones articulated, that is, lying next to one another in the position, and I was just blown away. From teeth and tusks, we learned that this creature was a 50-year-old pygmy male who died a solitary death nearly 13,000 years ago. His remains, hidden and protected under a sand dune, are a blueprint for studying pygmy mammoths. They also brought Larry Agenbrod to Santa Rosa. It was 1994. Agenbrod was then a Colombian mammoth expert. This would be his entree into the pygmy world. This is one half the pelvis, the other half's down here. You're going right up the backbone. In the position where Louise is at, you have the two uh, shoulder blades, or scapula, right up the neck, and you have a uh, partially damaged cranium. And if we're real lucky, I'll show you the tip of the tusk very shortly. There it is. We had this animal that was completely articulate. Even the tiny little bones in its littlest toe were still there in life position. Little arthritic spurs between the joints were still there. The breastbone was still in life position. The little uh, bones that support the tongue, called hyoids, were still in the animal in life position. It's like he just laid down to take a nap and never woke up, and the sand dune came gently over him while the body decomposed and kept him in perfect condition. Those are really rare instances. They're highlights in uh, paleontological work. Almost instantly, the importance of the find was recognized and the skeleton was moved from its island to the mainland. The bones were coming back home, to the continent the mammoths had left so long ago. They had a story to tell, and it wasn't just about mammoths, it was about man. The 1994 pygmy mammoth is today in the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History. Here, its bones can be compared with other mammoth remains from the island, 
and elsewhere. We have more than a thousand pygmy mammoth bones here at the museum. And we have a few hundred Colombian mammoth bones. The difference between the Colombian and pygmy mammoth bones is dramatic. What we have here is a pygmy mammoth femur and a Colombian mammoth femur. There's quite a big difference. This is the top bone of the hind leg and this ball is what fits into the hip socket. Curator Barbara Prince has spent much of her career working with mammoth bones. This is a mammoth tooth and by measuring it the length and the width, we can learn how old it is. And we count the plates, and that also helps to tell us the age of the animal. And we can look at it and see that it was a good, healthy mammoth. And I measured it before, and I think it was about two or three years old. So that's not very old. The teeth really tell us a whole lot about the animal. The bones are brought to me in various packages, and I identify them catalog it in the computer, give it a number, and uh, put it into one of our cabinets. And then they're ready for people to come and study. And we do have lots of people that come and study them. The first pygmy mammoths were reported as early as 1873. Fossil hunter Chester Stock in the 1920s was the first to intensely study them. He spent a lifetime researching the world of long extinct mammals and mounted several expeditions to the Channel Islands. Stock was the first to see the pygmy as a new species, a species he called Mammuthus exilis, the exiled mammoth. Possibly the most controversial mammoth hunter was Phil Orr. He often lived on the island trying to uncover its secrets. Mainly his interest was in the interaction between mammoths and early humans. It was man, he concluded, who hunted the pygmies to extinction. In early spring, Santa Rosa is green from winter rains. But plants are not the only beneficiary. Bones are often revealed by erosion, and Ag and Broad and Mars have come looking for them. Some material there that's usually productive. It's about the only way to continue this survey is to just keep going up each one of these Arlington Springs. Ag and Broad has returned to Santa Rosa every year since 1994 to work on mammoths. The big pelvis we got. For a paleontologist, this is the place to be. The uh, Channel Islands, since it's now a national park, you can't go in there and have major excavations. You have to let Mother Nature do the work. So what we do is we look along the sea cliffs and we look along the drainages. Today, uh, we're going to localities that have been productive for years, and it's a matter of seeing what has been exposed by winter rains. It's just like this giant fruit cake. The pygmy mammoth fossils are the raisins in the plum cake, and we're going to go along and find them. Getting around the island is eased by the old roads and trails of the ranchers who once lived here. The canyon cuts into the grasslands. Its eroded walls are constantly shedding and revealing bits of the past. Color and shape are factors in finding bones, but mostly it's about experience and having a sharp eye. Even so, it's never easy. The problem here is a lot of these rocks do very excellent bone imitations. I saw one just a few minutes ago pointed out to Larry, and it really looked promising, and it was just, just another piece of shale. I think I'm getting better at it, but <laughs> it can be discouraging sometimes. Don't see any laying in the creek bed like we did one time. I might see a rib fragment up there. Long white thing. 
what we've got here is one bank of, of this stream, and if you look down here, you see geologically old clays and so on that have been uplifted out of the ocean. And right about here where my uh, walking stick is, you start seeing heavy gravels and so on. This is the bed load, or the, the gravels in the bottom of an ancient stream. And from here on up, we find mammoth remains in this material we call alluvium that was brought in by the stream. So what we're doing is we're scouting these canyons because they have cut through this layer cake, so to speak. It finds the bones that we don't have any idea where they're at. And each year, new deposits are exposed. That's what makes it exciting. Okay. The fact that mammoth bones were found poking out of the Siberian soil gave rise to their name. Oh, yeah. Okay. Russian folklore says these creatures lived underground. The word mammoth means earth mole. You get in these gullied, highly eroded areas, and you have to look at your feet, you have to look above you, and even turn around and look behind you. It's going on a treasure hunt, and you're never sure what's going to be around the bend. Sometimes you have to take the binox and look because it depends on the light and so on, but there's a uh, big white, white colored rock right there in the face. And if you look just below that, you can see the edge of a uh, scapula, shoulder blade. Oh, scrap all over that, that wall. Sometimes when you're walking up a canyon, you'll find a little scrap of ivory. Right away, that, that sends up your sensors, you start looking. Where did this come from? Did it come from the wall? Did it come from further upstream? You begin like a gold prospector. You know, you pan the gravels and you find a little color and you move up to see if you can get richer color. You do the, exactly the same thing when you're prospecting for faunal remains. There's a trowel. Look, it looks like a piece of a weathered tooth. Looks like... A big rib up here, I think. It's been freshly exposed. This end's essentially broken off. We've got a little bit of flat long bone up in here, like maybe a scapula or a pelvis blade. As we go on up the uh, creek, we'll find more in about this level. I've never been any place other than the mammoth site in South Dakota where we had so many individuals in one relatively small area. This island is 53,000 acres, but almost everywhere we look, we find mammoth remains. Colombian mammoths, ancestors of the pygmy, were first found on the mainland of North America. Today, they can be seen with other Ice Age animals at the La Brea Tar Pits. Seeping out of the oil field for the last 40,000 years, you've had natural asphalt, a trap, a kind of uh, prehistoric flypaper on which many of the large animals that inhabited the Los Angeles Basin got stuck. So at the La Brea Tar Pits, we have remains of mammoths, mastodons, direwolves, saber-toothed cats, lions, uh, ground sloths, horses and camels, animals that you don't find today. The La Brea Tar Pits gives us a detailed picture of life in North America during the last ice age, between 40,000 and 9,000 years ago. Still, of all the large mammals at La Brea, only the Colombian mammoth is found on the Channel Islands. Colombian mammoth is a North American species. It um, is essentially middle Pleistocene to late Pleistocene. It's a uh, herbivore that lives in the Great Plains, the grasslands, mostly from the Great Plains into the southwestern United States. This Colombian evolved from the first mammoths to enter the New World, a creature called Mammuthus meridionalis the southern mammoth. Millions of years ago, Mammuthus moved out of Africa and began its slow trek across Asia. After crossing the Bering Land Bridge, 
they settled down in the New World and evolved into the Colombian. The Colombian weighed 10 tons and stood 13 feet at the shoulder. The tusks were 10 feet long. The trunk was flexible enough to pick up a single straw or to smell food miles away. They adapted to a variety of environments, from savanna to grassland, and for a while, island living. Larry's interest in pygmies came late in his career. Before that, he studied the Colombian mammoth that once roamed the Black Hills of South Dakota. South Dakota is sort of unique. We have Colombian mammoths here, and we have woolly mammoths. If you look at the map of South Dakota, the Missouri River essentially cuts it in half. 26,000 years ago, that area east of the Missouri River was glaciated. West of the river is still unglaciated, essentially a cold grassland in this Black Hills region. Larry is the founding scientist of the Hot Springs South Dakota Mammoth Site. It's a museum built over a sinkhole that eons ago drowned and entombed a great many ancient beasts who came there to eat and drink. As of last July, by tusk count, we have 52 mammoths, 49 of which are Colombian mammoths, three are woolies. The Colombian mammoths, as far as we know, had uh, behavior patterns very similar to elephants. They were social animals with matriarchal groups for the young part of an animal's life. As soon as males became adult, sexually mature, they were ostracized from the family group. We try to understand the behavior of Colombian and pygmy mammoths by studying today's elephants. They uh, seem to be very social in that they greet each other. They probably use their trunks to express affection. We think, we have no way to know, but we think they probably had the same or similar emotions as we see in African elephants today. I'm particularly intrigued with mammoths because here's an animal that's been on this continent for more than two million years and has made it right up to 11,000 years ago. It was a contemporary of human beings when they first came into this continent. It was also the subsistence base for some of those human beings. It's an animal that has recently in human uh, lifetime become extinct. That makes you ask questions, why? It's an intriguing detective story, if you will. It's a detective story with three possible suspects. First is the weather. Climatic changes drastically altered the environment at the end of the last ice age. But was that enough to wipe out a species? Or did man find a continent full of trusting great beasts that had never experienced the ultimate hunter? Were mammoths hunted to extinction? Or did the arrival of man bring with him diseases that struck down the mammoths and other ice age beasts? It's still a mystery. How the mammoths got to the Channel Islands, however, appears to be settled. The answer comes from modern elephants and from geology. During the last ice age, the Channel Islands were part of Santa Rosé, one vast island just a few miles from the California shore. The island was only like five or six miles from the mainland. And if you had something like commonly happens along the California coast now, a lightning strike fire that burned off a lot of vegetation and you had a bunch of mammoths there, all of a sudden they don't have a lot to eat and yet they can smell the vegetation on these islands or that super island coming in on the westerly winds, they're going to swim for it. And we have cases where they do that in modern elephants coming out of the jungle, swimming to an island they can't even see because they smell fruit ripening out there. Much of what we know about swimming mammoths is inferred from watching elephants, who happen to be powerful swimmers. 
they have naturally buoyant bodies. You've got to think of an elephant, say, as being very similar in form to a concrete boat or to a steel-hulled vessel. If it was just a slab, it would go straight to the bottom, but because it has this smoothly rounded yet large contour, it's able to naturally be buoyed within the water. Elephants are not only big, but they're strong, and they are able to paddle just using their legs prodigious distances. There's some wonderful examples of mahouts sitting on their elephant's necks, getting them down into the water, and traversing distances of 20 to 30 kilometers at once. Many thousands of years ago, there were probably several migrations of Colombians swimming to the great island of Santa Rosé. However, by the end of the last ice age, rising sea levels transformed the landscape and formed the Channel Islands. The mammoths were now trapped on the smaller islands. To survive, they would have to change. The appetite of the Colombian was huge, 600 to 700 pounds of food a day. As the island shrank, food became scarce. In response, the Colombians had to get smaller. And even though fossil evidence indicates that Colombians and pygmies live side by side, the days of the Colombian mammoths on the island were numbered. Evolution had created a new species to adapt to the island's limited resources. The pygmy mammoths had inherited the islands. Don and Larry's search for mammoth bones has taken them to a canyon cutting into the marine terraces along the coast. Well, we got a bone in the wall. We don't know exactly what it is yet. We'll at least check it out. The, uh... The odds are that it's probably mammoth. They'll use mountain gear to scale the cliff. It won't be easy, but Don is experienced in retrieving bones from difficult spots. Don's got uh, several really valuable specimens by dropping over from the top. We got a mandible at uh, the wall. We got a uh, complete humerus at another locality. He got some teeth up here on another cliff. You don't do this for fun, but it's a good way to get this stuff back. It's about the only way. These things are steep enough, you don't want to dangle around there without the right equipment. Well, that sage smells nice. The layer of soil the fragment is in helps determine its age. Piece of shale. In the case of Santa Rosa, the older the layer, the more likely it's a Colombian mammoth. But as you come closer to us in time, closer to the surface of the ground, more likely it's a pygmy. Okay. Tinfoil is a cheap and easy way to wrap and protect bone. And despite its location, the fragment was easy to retrieve. Okay, we're home free. All right. I'm glad we got it because it'll go away in the next rain. It'll get lost down this gully, and I, I doubt we'd ever recover it. So something is, is definitely better than nothing. You look just like a prairie dog coming out of the hole, Don. And I think about every time we've been out here, we've had a ranger on the rope trick uh, to get something that was over the side on a cliff. And I don't think there's any question that it's a mammoth rib. So uh, it's a big one. This could even be a Colombian because a uh, pygmy mammoth rib is, of course, much, much smaller than the Colombian. We get about 10 pygmies for the remains of any Colombian that we get. So these are the ancestral animals 
and uh, the others that we're finding are the descendants, the, the island-shaped men. In the end, Santa Rosa can be seen as a petri dish for watching evolution. Plainly, the mammoths didn't come as tiny mammoths. They came big and grew small. It possibly took only about 3,000 years for the Colombian to evolve into a new species, the pygmy mammoth. I'm finding an animal that was apparently ideally shaped for this island and may have been existing on this island yet if we hadn't had the arrival of humans. Similar stories of dwarf elephant-like creatures called proboscideans turn up around the world. The Mediterranean once had three-foot-high elephants. Indonesia and the Philippines had dwarf stegodons, an earlier form of proboscidean. But pygmy mammoths are only found off North America. In every case, islands are the key. On the Channel Islands, finding pygmy mammoth bones is not about luck. Larry's search is to do with reading the geology and then placing careful bets, no matter how remote the site. Let's get it a little higher. This time, it's pay dirt. We've got the head of a right femur, the upper hind leg bone. And this is an adult because the femur ball is fused to the shank. So what we'll do is we'll take this out. It's probably a uh, pygmy mammoth, although it could be a small female Colombian, but I'm, I'm betting it's going to be a pygmy. Well, you see that break in the wall over there. From there up is Pleistocene. From there down is older than Pleistocene. And what that means is <clears throat> we're right on the contact with tertiary sediments that are being lifted up out of the ocean and uh, land sediments being placed on top of them. And the uh, mammoth is one of the land animals that would be in that sediment. So I think this is a neat find. Despite the wind and heavy surf, there's no end to finding bones. What we've got here is a badly exfoliated or eroded tusk. Because it is so badly eroded, we probably will not collect it. Guess what we got right here? Ah, two. This is one tooth plate. What? An unerupted <laughs> tooth plate. So uh, the more we look, the more we're finding right here. This is one of the ankle bones from very likely this larger animal. This looks on the big size for pygmy, so it might be this female Colombian. OK, we got the uh, proximal end. The the near end of a tibia here. And there you can see the imprint of the bone. And these are the facets where the, where the uh, femur works against it. So this would be, if I were a mammoth, and if I don't fall off this cliff, it'd be the lower bone below my uh, femur up here. The build of the pygmy mammoth allowed them to negotiate this rugged terrain. In fact, the lower long bones are much smaller than you would expect if you were just to downsize a Colombian. Pygmies really were created by these islands. And I find that the pygmy mammoths could move up 8 to 10 degrees steeper slope than the Colombian. There's another thing that happens if you're going to be on steep slopes and you come down, you've got to have different musculature in your front limbs, and I'm seeing that reflected in the bones on the pygmy mammoths. We got a femur, we got a tibia, we got a patella, which is the kneecap. We saw this big tusk that's exfoliating. We know there's a scapula in the wall down there. So here it is, Good Friday. It's kind of like an Easter egg hunt. Only instead of finding colored eggs, we're finding mammoth bones. Although the bones tell us much about mammoths, where was early man in all of this? In the beginning, it was the pioneering work of Phil Orr that brought notoriety to the bones of Santa Rosa. Orr was the second curator of anthropology at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History. In the 1940s, he became interested in Santa Rosa Island and began a long-term research project on Santa Rosa Island to try and look at the whole scope of geology and archaeology. 
explorer oversaw a great many digs on the island. By reading the geology as well as the paleontology, he was certain that pygmies were eradicated by men. That is, the first Indians to arrive on the island hunted out the last of the mammoths. There's always been uh, conjecture about whether the earliest inhabitants on the island uh, encountered uh, pygmy mammoth, and Phil Orr was the first to discuss this. Now, what we haven't found is any convincing evidence that, that actually occurred. Don Morris was very interested in the earliest evidence for humans on the Channel Islands. So Don came to me and he said, you know, Phil saved a block of earth that still had bones embedded in it and wrapped it up in a plaster jacket. And that's stored at your museum somewhere. And so we made a search and found it in a basement storage area. Radiocarbon dating indicated the bones were possibly the oldest human remains found in North America and suggested that these were the first people in North America to use watercraft. When Phil Orr originally found the bones at Arlington Springs, he thought they were of a man, and he called it Arlington Springs Man. But in our measurements of the bones, we found that the bone diameter of the femur is precisely in the range of females, so that Arlington Springs Man is really Arlington Springs Woman. I didn't think that those bones were as old as what Phil Orr believed them to be. He had published the date of 10,000 years. And so when the dates came back showing them to be 13,000 years, I was really astounded. I expected them to be a lot younger. If the date of 13,000 years for Arlington Springs women is supported by our most recent research on the islands, then it's highly significant because that date is the same as the date for the most recent evidence of pygmy mammoth on the island. And so it would be very strong circumstantial evidence that the first humans to arrive on that island saw those mammoths. And we know that people were hunting mammoths elsewhere in North America at the same time. If they saw these small pygmy mammoths out there, there's no doubt in my mind that they would have been hunting them as well. And that may have been the end of the, the species on the island. The mammoth was a walking store of food, shelter, and ivory. For early man, a smaller, less dangerous mammoth would have been easy prey, a gift from the gods. Were they hunted to extinction? On the south side of Santa Rosa Island, a ranger station will be home to a team of geologists, archaeologists, and computer experts. Maybe up on the top, maybe yeah, where his, maybe where his uh, other... Led by archaeologist John Johnson, they are looking to confirm the date of the Arlington Springs woman as the oldest human skeleton found in North America. More important, they're looking to uncover the relationship between early man and pygmy mammoths. So what we want to do now is date the geological layers that bracket the spot where Arlington Springs women came from and then confirm that very old date. If the date of the earliest human presence on the Channel Islands can be fixed, that date could in turn reveal something about when and how people first came to the Americas. One of the theories is that people came down the coast of North America you know, using watercraft. And the fact that Arlington Springs woman was found on an island means she had to have watercraft to get out to that island. And so this early date that we have for Arlington Springs woman would tend to support this theory. In 1959, Phil Orr excavated the Arlington Springs woman here. Recent excavations are an attempt to understand the stratigraphy to confirm the date of his find. In 1994, we cut a series of benches into the side of the hill so that we could look at the entire section. The bones were recovered from about nine meters, or 30 feet depth. The current exposure now has cut a much wider exposure in the lower portion so that we can understand the overall context of the stratigraphy. 
Johnson's team will use a number of tools to paint a picture of the ancient island. Stratigraphy will help confirm the date of Orr's discovery. Geologists will survey and analyze soil sediments. A GPS team will map the entire canyon. A pollen expert will try to get a handle on the plants that once grew here. And a detailed photographic record will be made. One of the most interesting tools is the three-dimensional scan. I'm scanning the area that they're investigating so that they've got three-dimensional measurements of everything they're doing. So I'm doing a large-scale uh, scan or survey of about a million points and the areas where they're um, dug up the, the old woman's bones. And then the guys finding the bones and, and whatever other little critters they find in the different layers, they'll be able to say exactly where they found them and measure their position relative to other layers. Probably the most significant thing we're going to be doing is using radiocarbon dating to date the different strata at the site. And this will bracket the stratum in which Arlington Springs women's remains were found and help corroborate the date that we got directly on the human bone. Radiocarbon dating is a direct look into the deep past. It's based on the fact that living things store up a special isotope of carbon, and when they die, that carbon begins to fade away. There's a certain amount of radiocarbon in the living plant or organ or, or an organism, and then once that animal or plant dies, then the clock starts ticking, and then we take and examine how much radiocarbon is left, and then that's how we can determine the age. The technique has shown mammoth bones and human bones that are very close in age. The quest now is to find other organic material from the site and from the same level. The best way we can date this section is to do a whole sequence of radiocarbon dates all the way up and down the section. We want to not only date the bone, but date other organic material that's in the geologic deposits. In the case of the Arlington Springs woman, it's mouse bones. What we have here, outlined by string, is a stratum in which we find a lot of mouse bones. And these are bones of an extinct species of mouse, much larger than the, the deer mouse you find on this island today. And uh, this is important because the block of earth that contained the human bone is also filled with these bones of this extinct species of mouse. It's another of the odd evolutionary impulses of islands. The elephants get smaller, the mice get huge. In the case of the mouse, it's probably to do with the lack of predators and an abundance of food. We don't find those mouse bones in the stratum above or the stratum beneath. Now the other clue is the clay that you see here matches the clay that's in the block of earth in which the bones were embedded. And the sandy layer overlying the clay matches a corner of that block of earth. So we feel pretty confident that the block of earth in which Arlington woman bones were embedded is the same as what we have here. By matching mouse bones and clays, they can be sure the stratum they are working today is the same that Phil Orr worked many years ago. Don Morris sees a connection with the Arlington Springs woman and pygmies. I like to say the first people may have, and the emphasis on may, uh, may have seen the last pygmy mammoths. Whether they hunted them, whether they had any mammoth burgers to go along with their seafood diet, uh, we absolutely do not know. If you say, here's the mammoths, and their time range is here, they may have ended here and people came in right at the same time or right above it. And I think that they, they may have overlapped by a few, you know, by a few tens of years. But we only have remains of one human 
and we only have one geologically recent pygmy mammoth. What we need would be 20 or 25 more mammoths in the same stratigraphy. Arlington Springs woman is dating right about the same time as the last mammoths that I've dated. So that's part of the excitement right now is where can we find and date the youngest mammoth on the island and then how does that compare with Arlington Springs uh, human remains. Did the people of Arlington Springs witness the last of the mammoths? And did they have a hand in their final moment on Earth? The search for the connection between early humans and pygmy mammoths presses on. Today's task is to retrieve a tusk that may have coexisted with man. This is an area on Carignan that we call the wall. And you can see why we call it the wall, because it's a pretty sheer face. There's a tusk up above we'll collect a piece of and take it in for dating. It's not uh, in good enough shape to take it in for a specimen. But we'll try a date on it because it's very high in the section, the geologic section. And it may be roughly correlative with the Arlington Springs human remains. So we'll give that a try. The tusk is gripped tightly in the earth, but a pickaxe will soon loosen it up. You know, this is a, looks like going towards the tip of a, a tusk that was known by fragments back up here a couple of years ago. And you see water, water has come right down through here and exposed this end of it. What we had intended to do was to uh, collect these fragments of tusk today and use this as a uh, accelerator mass spectrometer radiocarbon date to see if it's somewhere in the range of the uh, remains, the human remains from Arlington Springs. Okay, Don, I think we can take this. It'll probably come in two fragments, but I think... Okay, I can undercut it right here. Here you go. Go ahead and just pull apart right there. Yeah, this is definitely coming to the tip. But this ought to be, ought to be sufficient to get a date from. We'll wrap it in tinfoil when we get back. That newly exposed area was what was showing from the bottom of the wash a while ago. Searching for bones, you never know what to expect. But the hope of a dream find is enough to keep you going. A lot of people ask me, won't you be excited when you find a mammoth bone with a spear point in it? I have a different perspective. I want to find a human rib cage with a mammoth tusk in it. And that'll be the who done it for me. Mammoths disappeared from these islands over 11,000 years ago, and we still don't know why. Was man the culprit? Phil Orr, clear back in the 60s, his hypothesis was that the first people on the island ate the last mammoths. And it's looking a little more like he might have been right. We need the hard evidence to back him up or to prove it wrong. For Larry, unearthing the pygmy is yet another chapter in a lifelong study of man and mammoth. It's been a fantastic uh, research experience for me. I'm still learning every, every time I deal with mammoths, I'm still learning, and I probably will be till I cease. In the end, although no ancient tools or weapons have been uncovered with the mammoths, the evidence so far implicates man. Man may have once lived with the pygmy mammoths, and they didn't survive. Exactly what happened is a secret the island continues to withhold. Still, more mammoths are out there, somewhere waiting to speak to us. We haven't heard the last from them.